Uh, my name is Toby Tuktinski. I'm uh, privileged to be moderating this panel today. Um, in, in many respects, uh, I think we'd like to continue the conversation from this morning's panel about key drivers in energy and carbon reduction measures, but with a little bit of a change in focus. One, we are, we're talking today with mid-tier, uh, leading mid-tier mining companies. And also, I think we'd like to broaden the discussion uh, beyond just renewables. Um, certainly on a personal basis, uh, at Convergent, we are energy storage project developers, and that sort of speaks uh, to us as well. We have 26 megawatts of uh, operational energy storage assets here in Ontario, half of which is for behind the meter use, but all of it is standalone, not integrated with renewables. So we, we recognize that energy storage is a piece of the puzzle and uh, can be part of a broader framework of, of tools and technologies that can be used for uh, managing energy and addressing the energy uh, problems that these companies are facing. So without further ado, I'd like to turn uh, our attention to our panelists, and I'm going to allow each panelist to uh, introduce, the, introduce themselves. And also, um, if you could, to help get the conversation started, um, if you can note whether you currently have any renewable energy, energy assets um, operational at your sites. And if you're assessing them, we will look at that as well. But let's start with uh, those of you who may or may not uh, have any assets that are operational now. Um, so I'd, I'd like to turn it over to Tony to introduce yourself first, and we'll go around. I guess this is going to work on, oh, sorry, it does there work you on this one. There you go. <laughs> yeah, in my case, I'm, I'm Tony McCooch. I'm running uh, Kirk and Lake Gold. Uh, we have uh, mine operations in, in northern Ontario. Uh, we employ about uh, 2,000 people in, in northern Ontario, between the Macassa mine and Hold Holloway Taylor operations, there and we produce should produce about you know close to 300,000 ounces of gold a year. And we also have operations over in uh, in Australia, both at uh, Fosterville, which is in uh, Victoria, part of Australia, and up in uh, Northern Territory, up in uh, by north of Dar or south of Darwin. <clears throat> in terms of renewable energy sources right now we, we we're not using any uh, we are looking at uh, in, in terms of what we're up to in terms of restarting operations in the northern territory uh, and hydro costs or power costs in 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 australia are much higher than they are in canada and so, so and and we're looking at alternatives and, and what we can do and you definitely have access to a lot of solar energy and so we're looking at what to do as part of a restart for that operation i think the biggest thing that we do uh, you know the other thing that we do though in kirk and lake gold is is uh, over at the macassa mine where we're you know we're almost 75 almost 100 percent reliant on our production equipment is battery powered equipment and we're actually on our third generation of of battery powered equipment we have batteries that are now coming out of service from from it being used to, to power the trucks and the, and, and the LHDs underground, that now we're looking at potentially using for a second life uh, system, put as uh, power, you know, as storage on surface to help deal with peak power demand. But you know, definitely, you know, when we take a take a view on power and uh, and and solutions for power, you know, we you got to sort of stop stop and think. We intend to, with all of our minds or all of our business, to be here 40 or 50 years and. And, and you know when you, when you look at inflation and reliability of supply, we're 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 sort of at a point in time we got to start making making some decisions about you know maybe going back to what people did 50 or 100 years ago and start start having a lot more ownership into the power plants or, or power supply. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, so I'm Paul Charan. I'm the chief operating officer of Durango Gold. So we have uh, the Sabadell mine, which has been operating in Senegal for 10 years. Uh, in terms of energy, uh, it has about an 18 megawatt facility and, and plus two, six generators, 6.3 megs each. Um, so we run on um, heavy fuel oil, HFO, and we are looking at potential uh, complements to that uh, through solar uh, because it's in West Africa. It's right on the edge of the Sahel. It has very good energy uh, from, from potential uh, PV cells, um, solar cells. Um, so we're going to produce around 240,000 ounces this year out of the Sabadella mine. It's got a long mine life. It's over 13 years. As Tony mentioned, we're focused on uh, long mine life as well. Uh, we're also in the middle of a build in Burkina Faso, so that's called the Wanyan mine, uh, formerly the Banfora. Uh, so we'll be in operation late next year in uh, 2019. So that'll be producing somewhere in the range of 130,000 ounces a year. It'll be a little smaller than Sabadell in terms of energy. We've also elected to go with heavy fuel oil there. It'll be about 11 to 12 megawatts. Um, 
For a number of different reasons, the opportunity there in terms of power is different on power, uh, but it is a little closer to a grid. Um, and lastly, we have an emerging uh, deposit that will put out a maiden resource next year that we are strongly believe will be our third mine uh, into the far future. We also have a number of very exciting exploration projects, so we're a, we're a, a growing company. We're on the edge of mid-tier producer right now, maybe a little below, but we expect to be in the mid-tier category within about two years. Great, thank you. Bruce? I'm uh, Bruce Armitage, I'm the energy manager for Tahoe Canada in Timmins. Um, <clears throat> we have two active mines, Timmins West and the Bell Creek Mine Facility, as well as the Bell Creek Milling Facility. Uh, we're connected to the grid for electricity. Uh, we have a lot of diesel consumption for all of our vehicles and we heat our mines via propane. Uh, we're not using any uh, renewable sources right now, although we are looking at uh, electric vehicles and we're looking at uh, doing some solar. Okay, great, thank you. Shirley? Hi, I'm Shirley Nault with Hudbay Minerals. Um, our um, our long-standing operations are in Manitoba and uh, luckily enough for us, um, that has been uh, renewable energy um, from the electricity side uh, for uh, essentially the entire existence of that operation, which is uh, uh, fastly drawing on 100 years. Um, so um, because of that, it, it also has um, um, some, some bearing on some of the challenges that I know we're going to get into as well later. Um, conversely, uh, our operation in, uh, relatively new operation in, uh, in Peru, uh, we constructed um, without being grid connected, um, but have since uh, become connected to the grid in, in that uh, location. And those are our two operating entities right now. Thank you, Shirley. Pierre? Uh, I'm Pierre Paris. I'm uh, president of uh, Montagne d'Or, uh, North Gold, uh, Columbus Gold uh, joint venture in uh, French Guiana, and also a representative of uh, North Gold uh, here. Uh, North Gold uh, is operating uh, mines uh, in Russia, Kazakhstan, uh, in Burkina Faso, Guinea, and uh, maybe in the future uh, in French Guiana. Uh, today we've got different uh, uh, energy supply options. Uh, uh, we've got mines connected to the grid, uh, uh, producing their own power with uh, diesel, uh, diesel engines. But uh, we are looking uh, to move to a renewable on uh, three of uh, our mines uh, in West Africa. Uh, first in uh, Burkina Faso, uh, Bissa Bouli. Uh, it's an operation uh, with a requirement of 30 megawatts and we plan to move to a 25% renewable uh, in the near future. Uh, we've got the feasibility that is going to be completed by January, so that can move uh, fast. Uh, we've got a uh, Taparco also in Burkina Faso that is going to, to, to move uh, to 25% renewable, uh, which is uh, 15 megs, uh, so 25% of 20 of 15 megawatts uh, requirements, and uh, we've got Lefa in Guinea uh, that is also going to move to 25% of renewable in the near future. But uh, the main change has been uh, very soon, uh, as it was mentioned this morning. We've got some, uh, we are facing some issues uh, in uh, French Guiana to get our uh, project approved. Uh, in fact, we haven't submitted any uh, approval uh, files right now, but uh, we went through a public debate uh, last year that was quite uh, uh, quite interesting, and uh, we, we had to make uh, major changes to our project to, uh, to to move forward, and we decided that uh, instead of connect to the grid, that was the initial plan. Uh, building a 100 kilometer line, uh, we were going to, to go 100% uh, uh, hybrid and our target is going to be uh, at least 80% of uh, solar uh, power. So it's going to be, uh, it has to be uh, solar batteries and, uh, and, and gensets, maybe uh, some hydrogen uh, uh, energy storage solutions too, because we are going to have a nexus of uh, uh, PV production sometime and we need to find ways to, to store it and reuse it. Okay, great. Thank you, Pierre. So it sounds like um, uh, 
a couple of companies at various stages of considering renewables, um, but nothing sort of in the ground on, on, a, on a large scale right now. So let's talk about some of the, the barriers and, and, the, and the thinking and the, and the drivers around um, putting these projects in place. Um, so Pierre, since uh, you talked about being in advanced phases of looking at these projects and, and, and pushing these forward, can you talk about the, the reasons why? What were the key motiv motivations for doing these projects? Was it cost? Is it uh, sustainability, carbon reductions? As, uh, as it was uh, presented this morning, uh, prices of uh, renewable energies are dropping. And uh, these solutions that were quite expensive uh, one or two years ago are becoming uh, more cheaper now. So we, we can consider them as a good alternative to uh, uh, diesel uh, gensets or other heavy fuel uh, uh, production on site. Uh, logistics I is an issue in uh, our operations in Africa. You need to bring fuel uh, to run your genset. So moving to renewable uh, is going to uh, decrease uh, tension on the, on the logistics and that is, is a long-term solution. And as it was mentioned this morning, we, even if we are mid-tier companies, we, we also uh, need to consider uh, expectations from our uh, customers. Uh, not gold is uh, producing gold. And as for diamonds this morning, uh, people buying gold uh, are expecting uh, us to do much better. And, uh, and uh, in that purpose, we, we need to, to, to look greener. <laughs> so, right. uh, renewable is a, good, is a good option today because uh, it, it, it's good for the economy of uh, our projects. Uh, that's what we, we found on, the, on this project in uh, French Guiana. We found that, in fact, uh, moving to a full hybrid solution, maybe cheaper, or at least more reliable at the end than connecting to the grid. Interesting. And you don't depend to change in rates and prices. You can really run your operation separately and you don't rely on anyone to set the prices. Right, okay, so it sounds like economics is a very strong driver and also customer demand is playing a role. Um, Paul, you, I know that you, uh, you're looking at some energy, or renewable energy as well. Can you talk about the project you're looking at? Yeah, um, I think for where we operate, which is in a similar location in West Africa, uh, we'll start with Savadella. So Savadella has been operating for 10 years. Um, we have an 18 meg HFO heavy fuel oil facility. Um, but really, when you take a look at the cost, the operating cost on a competitive basis, uh, with solar, with minimal amount of storage, uh, you're actually really about even with, with what our HFO is. And you're really only looking at 15, maybe 20% max on the amount of supplement feed that you would be able to give. So as a result, you're duplicating capital. Um, so what we're looking at uh, potentially is um, a power purchasing agreement um, for Sabadella and the size of that facility, whether it be 2, 5, 10 meg, uh, would actually affect the economics. So we're looking at, at ways that we can optimize the feed, the complement feed. And now that it's competitive, look at ways that we can save our capital. We're in the middle of a build right now um, and capital is is at a premium, so we need to focus our energy and our capital on actually executing on that build. So Savadella has some potential as a complement, and then we went through a fairly thorough process for the new mine in Burkina Faso, which is to be operating uh, late, I want to say this year, but we're not in 2019 yet. Um, but when we went through that evaluation process, there were a couple of other factors involved. First is, it's, it's uh, lower in latitude, so you get a lot more cloud cover. So the actual energy you get out of the PV cells is less. Second thing, this is very important in this particular area, is farmland. Every square inch is, is, is spoken for. It's not like in Sabadella, which is in the Sahel. And if we were to build a facility that were to match the amount of um, power we needed, 10, 12 megs, it would be immense. And the impact to the local stakeholders would be, would be severe. So that was a major consideration. Um, the other thing we also could look, could look and are looking at at, at Burkina is a facility elsewhere and then connect to the grid. And we're working with the World Bank on that particular option. Would, would that be a virtual PPA? Or? Uh, that's, that's many, many things under consideration for that, what that may look like, and then what the size of that facility is. And then we're working with, um, with uh, the, the Senegal, or sorry, not Senegal, the uh, Burkina Faso Electric 
to, to work on that particular process. Um, so as at the moment, we have an individual uh, isolated grid with a heavy fuel oil, but when you take a look at a number of different variables, at some point we feel exposed to the, to the oil price. And then, and then we have the, just, just the uh, geometric considerations with the size of, of the field it would need to be. And then lastly, you could supplement some of that with battery, but battery is at the moment very, very expensive and not competitive. Um, just in terms of numbers, we're in the range of 14, 15, sometimes up to 17 cents a kilowatt hour. Now, you can, you can install um, a, a, a just straight power lower than that. Uh, cost of capital is huge, but then you're actually duplicating that capital, and that's, that's an important consideration for us as well. Sorry, you said you're at 14 to 17 cents a kilowatt hour on HFO. On HFO, okay. of course, depending on, on what price you have and taxes and, and so on and so right. forth. Okay, interesting. And uh, Shirley, you had talked about having renewables already in the grid. You yeah, have the benefit of hydro. Um, what about on site? Is this what sort of energy sources are you looking at as alternatives, or, or are you? Is it uh, does it factor in? So in the uh, Manitoba context, for sure, um, there are a couple other variables um, that are um, important considerations to um, and and barriers to switching from already available, uh, freely available, readily available grid power uh, for the electrical compo component of our energy need. And that is um, that we're nearing the end of mine life in the flint flon operations. Uh, so not exactly the best time to be spending a whole bunch of capital, uh, right. capital dollars. Um, and um, uh, Paul, I think, just alluded uh, to, to this uh, somewhat in that, and even though this is a long-standing facility, um, our overall footprint is always important um, to us in minimizing um, our, uh, our surface footprint. And um, at the moment, at least, uh, it seems any uh, renewables that aren't hydroelectric uh, grid supplied power are, uh, have, have, have a fairly large um, uh, physical footprint still required, uh, if not for the actual infrastructure of generating the electricity, then for sure for the storage, but when combined, definitely uh, some pretty impressive, uh, uh, impressive uh, volumes of land required, as was demonstrated in one of the, uh, uh, one of the presentations this morning, actually. Um, part of, and tied to that is, um, is uh, other environmental considerations as well, like species at risk or migratory birds. Uh, both of which um, may be under uh, uh, increased risk associated with wind or solar uh, installations. Um, and then um, one other item that I don't think has been mentioned yet uh, thus far is, depending on where you are in your permitting process, if you've already got a project submitted, uh, any change to that program, any change to that proposal, may very well risk your permitting process in both time and money. And you're, and you're sort of deep in this permitting, like 10 years in, right? So you don't want to mess that up. <laughs> great. And, and it's hard to argue with low-cost hydro. That's a, a great solution. You, it you got it. It's very hard to argue with low-cost green hydro right. electric power, yes. And, um, okay, so uh, Tony, you talked about um, advanced electrification of your, of your machinery. Uh, it, that would seem to go hand in hand with um, uh, alternative strategies for sourcing electricity. How do you think about uh, where you're getting your electricity from for those for that fleet? Uh, renewables, uh, grid, uh, alternatives. How are, you, how are you thinking about that? Well, okay, so <clears throat> we got a couple. Of, I mean, we got s some of the we got sort of a, a variety of of of, uh, of of decisions depending on where you are and where where our operations are. Yeah, I mean, for for the operation in Kirkland Lake at the Macassar mine, it it is it's a battery powered fleet <clears throat> of equipment. Um, you know, part of the goal there is is to use battery power to, or electricity to generate bad power for the batteries and, and save on, on ventilation or save on moving air around the mine. And, and you know, so some, some ways, you know, replace the power that you're going to use for, for moving air with, the, with, with what you need for moving your, moving your, your ore. Uh, we definitely generate a lot less heat, a lot less noise, a lot less dust. With the uh, with the battery powered equipment, so that's that's positive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the the 
the biggest thing, I mean, uh, driving all of our, uh, our, our uh, what we're trying to make from energy solutions, it's, it's fundamentally, it all comes to economics and I suppose social responsibility, but it's all about what is the cost going to be today, what's the cost going to be five years, ten years from now. In our industry, we're price takers, we're not price makers. Uh, no, you know, we can't guarantee what our price of gold is going to be five years from now, so we have to find solutions to, to, to <coughs> lower, lower costs, or, or, or improve, uh, sorry, or at least give us reliability of supply. And some of our operations, especially like the, 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 you know, down in Australia, you know, the discussion there, we have, we have access to a large land that's already been disturbed by past mining, past open pits and waste piles. We may be able to, you know, we are looking at, you know, as, as the alternative to, to put in solar panels, you get a lot of sun. And, 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 and so we could, we could do that and you don't have surety of supply all the time. The one, the one mine we have down in uh, in Fosterville, down by Bendigo, it's a it's a bio bio leaching plant, and that one requires very very, uh, uh, and, you know, you need surety of supply because if the if you lose power even for eight hours in a day, you can you can you can kill the bugs, and if you kill the bugs, it could take you from a week to three weeks for them to come back online. So, you know, part of it is looking at you know what are the options going forward. You're in a rising price environment for for hydro, can, or for electricity costs. For electricity, can you rely on governments to give to, to ensure you're going to have supply uh, two years from now, five years from now, ten years from now? Can you rely on on what the prices are going to be in future years? And if you and and, and you look at all those things, then you, you say, well, maybe I can control this. By, by doing some things by ourselves, so we you know we we spend money on electricity, whether we, whether we generate it, whether we buy it off the grid, or whether we generate it ourselves. So so you, you take the, take that long term view, and realize that we need it to, to run our business for, and for a long time, and and then you try to make the decision that's going to be the best for you know for 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 the communities and everything where you are, and so you know in certain parts of the world, it, or it, it, it it's it's it, it, you can we can make a decision on 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 uh, on a, a solar farm in other parts of the world like in, in Canada or in Macassa it's more focused on maybe you know we, we try to re use less power uh, than, than than what we would so we can we can we can take, take you know save save in that way mm -hmm. okay. right so uh, context specific is obviously a big big piece of it but I, I think you also laid out um, a lot of the challenges that you face in, in any energy solution uh, you know, things like life of mind, commodity pricing, um, how, and I want to turn to Bruce, how, in, in looking at costs and investing in capital or bringing in a capital solution to help save energy costs, um, how are you navigating those issues in terms of mine life, commodity pricing, um, and, and in thinking of like global adjustment costs here in Ontario? So the, there's, there's a couple things that we look at in mining. Um, <clears throat> And Tony alluded to the economics, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, the main thing ends up being safety, and as long as it passes that litmus test, then we can start getting on to the economics. And that, that's the true nature of it. Right now, electricity in Ontario, for all the, uh, the Ontario mines here, we're looking at about $110 a megawatt hour. Right. Now, we have excellent programs. Um, the ISO has the Industrial Accelerator Program. The Ministry of Northern Development has the NIRE program, and that helps it, us make electricity and uh, our cost of energy a little bit more, less burdensome, let's put it. But when you start to look at uh, what mines are doing, a lot of it ends up doing, it's because of costing and, and global adjustment. So if you look at a $110 a megawatt hour and you look at for most mines, anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of that is based on global adjustment. Your your top peaks, that's what you start looking at, and it's cost competitiveness when you're looking at our neighbors. When you look at your neighbor to the east, uh, Quebec is 49 dollars a megawatt hour. To the west, Manitoba is 43 dollars a megawatt hour. So it makes it hard uh, to make long-term commitments uh, in investments in infrastructure in the Ontario market at $110 a megawatt hour. So what, what companies like Tahoe and Kirkland Lake Gold and the others do is we start to look at behind the meter solutions. Now, there's you know two avenues for that. Uh, a lot of newer mines that have a longer life term, they can look at, at long-term solutions like wind and solar because the economics and the paybacks will be there. 
e even to buy out uh, behind the meter battery solutions on their own. Where you look at a, a company like ours, uh, if you look on our corporate site, our mine life is seven years. Now it was seven years last year, it was seven years the year before that, but when you start to look at, at tens of millions of dollars to buy batteries and you're looking at five to seven years to pay back that, what happens is companies don't want to make that investment because the market in Ontario is, is not secure because the governments are arguing and the one government doesn't, uh, you know, they, they take what the, the last government's done, better or worse, and they throw it out and, and they've wasted billions of dollars. So I'm not saying whether it's, you know, one political party versus the next or one level of government versus the next, but we don't have uh, a long-term plan as far as Canada to meet all of these initiatives from Paris as far as what we're going to do. So now when we start to make these investments, a lot of it ends up being where we're making agreements with companies where they're going to come in, uh, they're going to take the capital costs of putting in a battery or putting in a solar farm, and we're going to share the savings. Now those models may be economical for the mine, but as uh, a couple of the speakers earlier alluded to, if you were able to put up the capital at the onset, you'd make a lot more money and it'd be a lot more viable for your company. With life of mine and, and what's going on with the economy and the government, it, it makes it extremely difficult. Can I ask a, a naive question? Somebody who's not in, from the mining sector. I'm you know, an energy storage product developer. We've looked at some mines, but <clears throat> this issue of life of mine is, comes up, obviously. If we're, if we're gonna invest in capital for long term on somebody's behalf, how real is life of mine? It seems to change. It seems to evolve over time. And, and how, how hard of a um, bookend is it for making those investments? Because you're making investments, right? <laughs> well, you know, when, when you're talking about Tim, it's, I may mean, use this excuse to talk about back in 2007 when we wanted to go back and, and explore and build the mines in Timmins. Uh, in 19, 1908, 1909, they had, uh, you know, one year reserves. And then 10 years later, they had mined, you know, say a million ounces of gold, and now I had three years of reserves. And so we're 100 years later. So part of it, life of mine, part of it is you have to have vision. You have to say, you know, you, you know, you, you, you got to build things for the future. Mines will close if we don't take, if we don't have vision in terms of prop, proper access, proper infrastructure to to to, mine, to to go into the mine, and proper, you know, all your proper input costs. So, you know, in, in the early days, the mines are the ones that built the roads, brought the railroads in, the ones that, that, that brought the hydro plants in, or the electrical uh, systems in to, to, for the communities to come there. And then, you know, governments took it over again. And, you know, fundamentally, we have to always take that long-term view when we're, when, when, what we're doing in terms of, of solution. And like you say, you can't always rely on the governments in terms of what they're going to do for your own business. And you know, your share price and your shareholders can suffer just based on government, so, so government mood at the time. So we have to find ways to, 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 to counteract that in terms of, in, of our investments. Right? Hmm. I'm going to take a pause uh, right now and see if there are any questions from the audience. Hi, I have a question. Uh, you work in various jurisdictions, Canada and Australia, in Africa, in Peru, in uh, French Guiana. Which government policies would you would like to point out as being good and conducive to the implementation of renewable policies? And how do they compare to what we're doing here in Canada? Sorry. Quebec. <laughs> Quebec has good policies in terms of supporting, you know, bring, bring in infrastructure to support mining, you know. I think a lot of the government, I mean, a lot of governments are trying, but there's a lot of pressures on, on certain things. A lot of it is, is where we, may, you know, the other part in our industry, and, and, and part of the reason why you need to build, you know, uh, you know some of our own generation facilities, because we're in remote areas at, at a lot of times. We're in, we're in different spots than, 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 than people are, so. That, that drives drives sometimes a, so the, uh, decision making, but definitely you know what you look at and how how the prov how northern Quebec has been developed, infrastructure brought in place definitely helps to to to, to build something there. Any other panelists want to answer? Uh, I think 
different perspectives in uh, different governments around the world, and, it, and, and in some respects depends on um, uh, the level of maturity, for lack of a better word, of, of that country. So from my experience, and I'm by no means an expert, <laughs> from my experience with the uh, Peru government itself, uh, it, it, it seems that um, um, the basics are where they are as far as what they're more, more interested in covering. And frankly, climate change is not one of those. It's more like making sure that the community water is not polluted, making sure the air quality is good. It's really basic um, stuff. Having said that, there are regulations in place in, in the country that do borrow from uh, from more established uh, uh, and uh, financially secure uh, countries and follow, uh, quite frankly, the lead of Canada often in that country. But that's not the same as everywhere. Um, so that's, that's my observation from for, for the Peru part of your question. If I could, Pierre, for, for the projects that you're looking at, are, are there government incentives or government policies that are promoting renewables or is it strictly cost driven? I would say that uh, probably France is not the best place to develop mines today. <laughs> I wouldn't say more. <laughs> but uh, I think that uh, France as uh, other European countries are facing uh, a huge challenge. Uh, the French president decided to uh, develop our industry, uh, economy, uh, to, to, to move uh, into the trans uh, uh, ecological transition. but. Uh, our governments have to ask themselves the question, uh, where are uh, the raw materials these industries are going to use uh, being produced? Where are these metals uh, being produced? What are the conditions, social conditions, environmental conditions in which they are produced? So I think they can't avoid this uh, discussion. Uh, do we want to develop a sustainable mining industry in our, uh, in our countries? And it's not only France. Some of our European countries got the same questions to answer right now. So, uh, in fact, uh, it's not like uh, in Ontario, but uh, uh, we can't really <laughs> rely in politicians to, to run our businesses. That's why uh, investing in uh, renewable in the, uh, energies uh, will make our business easier in the next years because uh, we can run our business ourselves independently uh, from any changes in uh, policies or, uh, or governments. Right. We've certainly seen the uh, carbon pricing, something that's gone way up and way down, and it's not something that's ever, has been predictable, at least in carbon markets, and it's um, companies that have been able to invest independent of those that I think have seen the long-term success. Are there uh, other questions? That I Okay, um, we've talked a lot about cost, um, and, and, and we just started touching on sort of carbon and, and policy. To what extent um, are are you considering carbon pricing or, or the potential for carbon pricing in thinking about energy costs over the next five to ten years? Um, Paul, do you want to start? Um, yeah, we we look extensively at the economics and as well allocation of capital. At the moment, since it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of an unknown, we don't factor it into our economics. It's more of a qualitative consideration as opposed to quantitative. So we know it's coming, um, and even if there isn't a value on it, there's, there's our, our own values and core beliefs that, that we, we, you know, we, we're moving towards more sustainable solutions for everything, uh, including energy. So, so in, in summary, we, we don't have any values. We don't factor it into our economics, but we know that at, at some point in time, it, it's likely to be part of the, uh, the equation. Okay. Bruce, what about, what about you? So for ourselves, we're actually trying to forecast some of that pricing and put it into some of our models. And uh, <clears throat> right now, it doesn't really look good. When, when you start to look at, uh, say, the NIRE program for the, for the ministry, uh, March 31st, 2022, that program ends. And if that program's not renewed and then you put in inflation and then you put in what the new carbon tax is, right now it's, in Ontario, I said $110 a meg. It's, it's $108 to $110 a meg. Uh, what we're forecasting is that's going to be $140 a meg. So 
what does that mean to, to some of the, the smaller companies out there? Uh, maybe it means that they close up shop. Some of the mid-tier, maybe they don't make an, an investments. So I think that I understand, you know, we're, we're actively looking at climate change and we want to be leaders in that. And, and I alluded to it earlier, I think that all levels of our government have to sit there and put a plan together that's going to be economical and not affect industries and not only our industry but all industries uh, because what's going to happen is you're not going to have any GDP and you're not going to have a lot of businesses if it continues to uh, to go in the direction that it's going in. Could I push you on that point? Um, you know one it, it sounds like there's a couple of different ways of responding to a projected price of $140 a megawatt hour. You could either push against it and hope that policy is going to change so it doesn't get to that point, or you look at solutions that will help you compete in that environment. Have you, are, are you taking the, the former approach or the latter, or are you looking at solutions that could help you? We're, we're definitely costs? looking, you know, the mining industry is always innovative. Um, we're not the only company, but all, all companies in, in the mining industry, I mean, you know, today and tomorrow are examples of this. Uh, you want to be leaders. You, you want to make sure that you're doing everything that you can to make your business economical. Uh, mm -hmm. And I mentioned it earlier, two factors. Number one, safety, and we always make sure because we have the highest standards in the world in Canada. Uh, we make sure that it's safe and then we have to make sure it's economical. So everything that we're doing, we have to make sure that these forecast models go through. So there's a lot of technologies out there right now that may help us on the economical side in five to ten years from now, depending on my life. But right now, some of those technologies haven't passed the Canadian standards as far as safety. Hmm. So as some of these technologies evolve and, and they, it's proven that they're safe, those will aid us in, in our economic models in the future. And, uh, just to clarify, are you talking about sort of like uh, fuel cells and, and things like that? or Fuel cells, hydrogen, mm -hmm. um, you know, hydrogen's a light gas and, and all of a sudden you put it underground and it's not safe. Uh, right. right now. Mm -hmm. Right now the technology is not there and, and the laws haven't passed to allow us to do this. But that could be the wave of the future and that, and that could be one of those uh, uh, avenues that actually replaces diesel. But right, we need, number one, it needs to, to be passed in law uh, in Canada, and then we have to make sure that it's, it's safe. And then we're going to look, and they have to have the infrastructure in there, and they have to make sure that the supply and demand is going to be there. Right. Tony, are you, are you looking at are you carbon a, pricing? Yeah, well? you're making a good point there. I mean, um, when, it, when it comes to batteries, even for batteries that we use underground, it's a different battery. We, might, we, we will use underground at the, in Magain and, and Macassa than the battery you'll get in your Tesla car. If you have an accident on, in, in a car and, 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 and the battery gets impacted, it'll catch fire, you can get out of the car. If we have an accident or an impact with a battery underground, it's, it's, it's part of the breathing system and you can't just get out of there. So, you know, we, the, the batteries are being designed and, and this is something that we have to take into consideration regulation that they, they actually don't burn. They, you know, it's, so you're, you're not using the, the t typical uh, cobalt batteries. You've got you to change the style of battery or ensure you have a different style of battery in an underground mine, similar to the, the considerations around, uh, around whether you go to hydrogen fuel cells, etc. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our session here. I'd like to thank the audience for your attention and your time. I'd like to thank our panel members. Thank you very much.